God, and let's turn in our Bibles this morning to Acts chapter 12. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12. And uh, we're looking at the latter part of the chapter, the closing verses from verse 20. Acts 12, commencing at verse 20. Now Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, but they came to him with one accord, and having made Blastus, the king's personal aid, their friend, they asked for peace, because their country was supplied with food by the king's country. So on a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to them. And the people kept shouting, the voice of a god and not a man. Then immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him, because he did not give glory to God. And he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God grew and multiplied. Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry, and they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Lord, will you bless your word to our hearts and glorify thy name. Amen. We've just read those latter verses from verse 20 to 25. And perhaps the standout thing in those verses we've, we've read is the death of King Herod. We're told that he was struck down by an angel of the Lord. And then we're told he was eaten by worms and died it was matthew henry the late great bible commentator has a classic line which says it was no less than an angel that killed him and no more than worms that destroyed him struck down by an angel and eaten by worms and it's important that we're focusing on these closing verses in this chapter this morning. And just to put them in their context as a whole, because the chapter began where it says about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And of course, he went on and imprisoned Peter. And if he'd had his own way, no doubt he'd have killed Peter in the same way that he killed James. But fortunately, the Lord sent an angel to deliver Peter from prison so that no harm came to him in order to preserve his life. But it's quite a contrast, isn't it, from the beginning of the chapter that Herod was in charge in verse one, trying to bring havoc amongst the church. Herod seemed to be in control. But by the end of the chapter, Herod is struck down dead and eaten by Worms. I think of the line of an old hymn that some of you may not know, but one of the verses speaks of the tyrants of this age struck briefly on the stage. And um, it's not the first time that this is in the Bible where something at the beginning of a chapter looks one way 
But by the end of the chapter, with the Lord's gracious intervention, things change altogether. You could go back to chapter 9, for example, in the book of Acts. Because there in chapter 9, Saul was breathing threats, it says, and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. He was all set on persecuting the church, set on going to Damascus to cause all kinds of possible trouble of other believers in that place. And yet by the middle of the very same chapter, Acts chapter 9, the Lord met with Saul on the road to Damascus and Saul, who'd gone out to persecute the church, has now become a Christian. And the arch persecutor of the church of Jesus Christ has now found that the believers are no longer his enemy, but his friend, and that he's a brother himself in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, folks, that's often how the Lord delights to work. He comes into a situation. It might seem that the situation is dead set against God's people. But then God intervenes. He turns the situation around absolutely remarkably. And that's true for the universal church of Jesus Christ. It's true in local church terms, how often the Lord works in the life of a local church. And it's also true in our individual lives, how God can step in just at the right time. Now, I don't know what you're going through, even though I'm your pastor this morning. I don't know everything about you. I don't know everything maybe that you're in the middle of and perhaps whatever it is in your life at the moment that is troubling you. Maybe you feel like you're at the beginning of one of these chapters or in the middle of it or at the end. But I want to say this, God changes things and can step in and passages like this they call us to trust in God. They don't deny the reality of our difficult circumstances, but they impress upon us that we have a sovereign God this morning. Hallelujah. One who is sovereign over all of these things, and yet one who is gracious, who loves his people, one who's working everything together for his glory and for our good and we can trust him so be sure this morning in effect the weather will change but it's not my intention this morning to spend most of our time focusing on the death of herod as dramatic and as striking as that is but rather, I want to put, zoom in on a single verse in this chapter and then to zoom out. And I want us to see it in something of the big sweep of the book of Acts. And this is the verse in Acts chapter 12 that I want us to look at. It's the penultimate verse, verse 24. But the word of God grew and multiplied. The word of God grew and multiplied. You know, Herod was having, as it seemed, his wicked way. But the Lord fixed Herod. And here we read, but the word of God grew 
and multiplied. And friends, it's a wonderful fact that God's word extended its reach and many others come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, folks, this isn't the only time we read a statement like that in the Acts of the Apostles. And that's why I want us to zoom out now and to see it in something of the big sweep of the book, because there are certainly four times in the Acts of the Apostles dotted through the book where we read of similar statements which speak in terms of the spread of God's word and the growth of his church. And um, we're going to have a look at them. In chapter 6, for instance, and in verse 7, we read, Then the word of God spread. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. The word of God spread. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly. If you turn back to chapter 9. After Saul had been breathing out his murderous threats. But then the Lord met him on the Damascus road. Turned him around. And the arch persecutor of the church became a follower of the Lord. He was ordained to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And we read in Acts 9 and uh, verse 31. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord... And into the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. And then, so back in Acts 9, in Acts 6, in Acts 9, we read of these statements. And now, in chapter 12, Herod had been harassing the church killing James, wanting to kill Peter as well, but the Lord delivered Peter. And then he sends his angel to strike down Herod. <coughs> and it says in verse 24, but the word of God grew and multiplied. Later on in chapter 19 of the book of Acts, we read something else. Acts chapter 19 and verse 20. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. So each of those four statements I've just read to you, even though worded slightly differently, but they make a very similar point. Dr. Luke, writing in his book of Acts of the Apostles, is speaking clearly about the spread of the word and the growth of the church. And so really, if I wanted to give the message a title this morning, I think I would just call it the church that never stops growing. The church that never stops growing. Because that's what the Acts of the Apostles is all about. As highlighted in those four similar statements I've just read to you, dotted through the book of Acts. It keeps on growing. Now, sometimes you read the Acts of the Apostles and you might get the impression that it's two steps forward on one step back, but the church keeps on growing. You could read the book of Acts and think to yourself, well, with the chapters that we've read, it may be 
it feels like the church could be snuffed out altogether. But friends, the church just keeps on growing throughout church history. You can read throughout the history of the church in this world through the last 2,000 years. And sometimes it seems like two steps forward and one step back on a good day. On a bad day, it seems like one step forward and two steps back. But friends, the reality is that the church of Jesus Christ just keeps on growing. Oh, there might be points in history when it seems like it's been largely lost and the church is in danger of being snuffed out altogether. But friends, the church just keeps on growing. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And folks, that's how it's going to be until his return. Because the church of Jesus Christ is always growing and never shrinks. You know, sometimes we can have a bit of a jaundice perspective when we I think about the church because we look around us in our own country and we see that churches can grow for a while and then we see churches shrinking churches rising and churches falling some churches open and then over the years they close but friends, speaking of the church of Jesus Christ as a whole, it is never shrinking. There will never be a time till Jesus comes back when there isn't a people who are part of Christ's church. It's always growing as God calls himself through the preaching of the Christ in the power of the Spirit. And folks, it's important for us to live our lives in that perspective because it's so easy to get disheartened and discouraged. But let's really realize, friends, that the gospel is always advancing. And whether it be in one place or in a certain place, another place, but friends, the church keeps on growing. In other words, there's nothing that the Herods of this world can do about it. Hallelujah. I've got three things for you. And the first thing is this. The church just keeps on growing despite despite you see when we read the acts of the apostles when we read throughout church history we look at the church in our day in our age across the world and we have to acknowledge that the church just keeps on growing despite what is going on around it now, the growth of the church isn't a walk in the park. We look at the Acts of the Apostles and at the early chapters. And when you think, you remember in Acts chapter 1, Jesus ascends to heaven. In chapter 2, he sends his Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. In chapter 3, the church is on the move. But then in chapter 4, persecution begins it was john stott that evangelical anglican preacher and bible commentator he highlighted many years ago in his commentary on the acts of the apostles the devil's multiple attacks on the early church and 
You know, in Acts chapter 4, the persecution was largely external persecution, coming from outside, seeking, you know, the unbelieving authorities, seeking to persecute the church. And they even said to the apostles, the ruling authorities in Jerusalem said to them, that they are no longer to preach in the name of Jesus Christ. But of course they took no notice of that. And though the persecution was real, the church just keeps on growing. So after the external persecution in chapter 4, when the devil didn't get his own way, <laughs> he thought of another plan. If I can't do it through external persecution, I'll do it through internal corruption. And Ananias and Sapphira, they sold land, they brought money and laid it at the apostles' feet. They only bought part of the money, nothing wrong with that. But they'd profess that they brought all of the money. There was everything wrong with that. There was hypocrisy. It was falsehood. It was deceiving the Lord. And you know, the devil worked through that couple to bring internal corruption trying to trouble the church from the inside. But thank God, in spite of, and the Lord had to deal with Ananias and Sapphira, in fact, they both went out dead. But the Lord used that situation to purify his people, because great fear came upon the church, fear of the Lord. So then, in Acts chapter 6, the devil tries something else. Pastoral distraction. Something that would get the apostles to take their eye off the ball. At the beginning of Acts 6, there's a different opinion arises in the church about the treatment of elderly widows. And a practical solution needs to be found because it's a very real problem. But what the apostles do is they appoint these first deacons, these prototype deacons, so that the problem can be properly dealt with while the apostles maintain their primary focus on the word and on prayer, upon the preaching of the gospel and the leadership of the church. So you see, the devil tried in chapter 4 through external persecution, and then in chapter 5 through internal corruption, and now in chapter 6, pastoral distraction. The devil was doing everything he could to snuff out the church and it was only a young church then. But he was trying to ruin Project Church. And yet, despite all of that, we read both in Acts 6 and verse 7, the word of God spread and the number of disciples multiplied greatly. And you know, you can see that Throughout the book of Acts, it wasn't that there was no opposition to the church. There was plenty of opposition. Sometimes things looked hair-raisingly difficult and perilous. But despite all of that, it tells us in Acts 9 and verse 31, the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee and Samaria had peace and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they 
were multiplied. And then, of course, in Acts 12, we've just read, but the word of God grew and multiplied. Friends, there were many difficulties throughout the following chapters in the book of Acts. Discussions about relationship between Jews that have become Christians and Gentiles that have become Christians and how all that panned out in terms of Jewish customs from the Old, time, Old Testament. And uh, in Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council uh, was set up and all sorts of difficulties came upon the church that on one level could have brought things to an end for the early church. But you see, despite the church keeps on growing. Friends, be encouraged. There will always be difficulties for the church of Jesus Christ. It will never be easy to be a Christian in this age. It's not that we're looking for trouble. It's not that we have some kind of mindsets that says bring trouble on. But it's being realistic. Friends, there are all sorts of stuff trying to snuff out Christian thinking in our society. There's all these laws being passed in Parliament with regard to abortions and now, what is it, assisted dying and all sorts of things. Friends, there will be trouble in this world. But the mark of a healthy church is not the absence of the challenges, but it's how we face those challenges, how we deal with them, how we handle them by the grace of God. Because remember, our first point is that the church keeps on growing despite, despite the trouble. Number two. The church just keeps on growing because we've just seen something of that word despite, but because is our second point. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ is the head of the church. As I've quoted, he promised he will build his church and that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so you see, the Lord is able to take all those despites and he's able to do something miraculous in them. You see, the devil is doing his thing seeking to finish the church. But it's the Lord who is growing the church. And the Lord uses the very things that the devil seeks to do to finish the church in his sovereignty. And God uses those things to turn them round to grow the church. You know, friends, you think about the um, church of Jesus Christ. You know, if you want your church to grow, we've got to get into the Lord's designs. You see, friends, the Lord will always raise up people. The Lord will always raise up elders and deacons and pastors and teachers and evangelists. And God will enable them to be supplied with everything that needs to be done, every resource, without taking their eyes off the ball and the gospel being sidelined. You see, for instance, in Acts 6, 7, 6, 
seven, when all that was going on about the care of the widows. And, you know, the Lord provided a way. And deacons were brought into the church. Praise the Lord for the deacons. I thought you'd say amen to that. <laughs> But you see, in Acts 9, Saul was going to finish the church off before it's barely got going. But the Lord had other ideas. The Lord decided, I'm going to save that man. And praise God, he set him apart to be an apostle to the Gentiles. And the very people he'd been persecuted, he was now preaching to, and proclaiming to the ends of the then known world God's grace, God's sovereignty, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, and churches grew, churches were raised up, and God blessed them. Now, let me tell you something. It was all because God is in control. You see, friends, those early apostles, sometimes we can get the wrong idea about them. Sometimes we can think that they were so super special that, you know, they were different from us. Let me tell you, they weren't. They were ordinary blokes. If you remember, Paul had to reprimand Peter in the book of Galatians. They didn't get everything right all the time, no more than any of you or me will get everything right all the time and time and time again. We get things wrong. But friends, they were faithful under pressure. Faithful under pressure. You see, they didn't just give it all up. They didn't just let go under pressure. They didn't let go of the gospel message. They didn't deny their saviour. I mean, here in Acts 12, Peter was in prison. But God's people prayed. And they were serving him faithfully. And sometimes in the church life, the pressure's on. Sometimes it's off. But very often, it's on. And these pressures can get very difficult in church life. But you see, we're looking to him. Look into the Lord Jesus. And as we continue to do his will, God will bless his church. He will cause his word to spread and the church to grow. Just imagine in Acts 7 how Stephen was martyred for his faith. You know, we, we haven't a clue in this country. As I said on Wednesday night in our Bible study, you know, somebody might call you a name or shun you or not like you and make it known that they don't like you for being a Christian. But friends, we know nothing of persecution. Stephen was martyred. Saul had consented to his death and great persecution arose. Friends, the Jewish church was scattered all over the regions of Judea and Samaria. They could have all given up. But friends, what did they do? They took the gospel with them where they went. 
And so it's not only the believers that got scattered, the gospel then got scattered and it began to spread beyond those people. All because they were faithful even when persecuted. Why? Because God was with them. So the church keeps on growing despite what's going on. The church just keeps on growing because the Lord is sovereign. And thirdly, the church will keep on growing. Because the purpose of the text this morning to show it you in those different places is that the word of God grew and multiplied. This isn't just a history lesson, folks, reminded us, reminding us what happened in the days of the Acts of the Apostles or inspiring us to think about what happened in the 1800s and the early 1900s. But God's word is inspired and designed to inspire us to trust God and to follow Christ in the present, in the here and now. I don't know about you folks, but I want to serve the purpose of God in my generation. And whatever your individual Christian life looks like now or in the future, whatever Leyland Pentecostal Church looks like now or in the future, whatever the church in the United Kingdom looks like now or in the future, Whatever may be happening in the church in the wider world, now or in the future, whatever may happen in the lives and ministries of our mission partners, now or in the future, whatever may be happening in the persecuted church in different parts of the world, now or in the future, we need to remember and to have faith that God's word will grow and the church will be multiplied right until Jesus comes. Friends, I know the church is a remnant and the people of God are a remnant, but I don't believe that God is coming for some kind of weak, worn out, you know, little tiny church in fact the book of revelation tens tells us it's going to be thousands and ten thousands times ten thousand and thousands of thousands i tell you he's coming for a glorious church now i'm not asking you whether you're part of this church leyland pentecostal church but i need to ask you first of all are you part of the church the universal church, in other words, have you trusted the Lord for salvation? Have you repented and turned from your sin and believed and trusted in Christ? Because if you are, if you have, then you are part of his church that keeps on growing. Friends, you can look in the book of Acts about all those who were opposed to Christ and his church but friends i want to say for you as a christian for you as a local body of believers i want to say like countless others god can make a way where there seems to be no way but let me ask you all a question Are you devoted not only to the Lord but to the church of Jesus Christ? Because let's be frank, not every Christian who belongs to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ 
is devoted to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, particularly in our day and generation. where it's comparatively an easy thing to be a Christian. We don't have great hostility and persecution. You know, in some countries today, you can't be a Christian unless you're really a Christian. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because being a Christian is so difficult and so hard and you face terrible persecution. But you see, in our day, in our country, it's far too easy to be a Christian. And so Christians have this half-hearted sort of attitude. The church will do when it suits. But friends, the Lord calls us to bring every aspect of our lives under the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And his desire for the church that is despised by the world is that we wouldn't see church as a mundane, everyday thing, but something that's wonderful, something that's worth it, something that is worthy enough for us to be devoted to. And friends, we can never outdo God's devotion to us, can we? So I pray that the word of God that grew and the church multiplied. I pray that we'll get it all in the right perspective and see that God is building a people of power. He's building a people of praise that will move through this land by his spirit and will glorify his precious name. And so we're going to stand and sing.